Well, good morning and welcome to London. And in fact, this is our last FS Club webinar of the year. And we're delighted to end on the merry-go-round of decades of technology featuring my dear friend, David Bannister, who's a research director in financial services at Bloor Research. Now, as you'll know, a Community's Chest is a series of interviews, really, where we interview wizened old men and we squeeze the last of the juice out of the lemon. Uh, and David's here to talk about decades of technology. Uh, I must also, of course, confess that we tried to record this last week, and I appreciate the many people who've come back online today to hear the end of it. So we're going to uh, cover a bit of old ground, but we're going to try and pretend that this started afresh because uh, we've also been around this, this loop again. Now, um, you'll know me, I'm Michael Mainelli, I'm one of the directors of Zien, and it really is a pleasure to be able to introduce so many of these webinars. We can only do so uh, because our sponsors allow us to range widely and freely across technology, economics, and finance. And today, of course, uh, we have a special guest who covers all three areas exceedingly well. In fact, even in the green room warm up, we were discussing Kuznets curves as well as old issues of Byte and information technology trivia. Uh, now, the format today is uh, going to be a fairly straightforward one. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk to, uh, give you a bit of background on our guest, and then we're gonna cover top of the in-tray, the most surprising things that David's seen lately, uh, and his views on social, technical, economic, and political issues to do with technology. And David's gonna give us a bit of an ask here at the end of the year. So it should be a lot of fun. Yes, this is being recorded. Uh, secondly, please do put your questions into the chat room. And for those of you who were here last time, I do have your questions here and we'll feed them into a conversation with David. Uh, but for all of you out there, please feel free to comment or contribute and we will have a, a fun, I think, end of your discussion. So David, um, you know, this is a bit of, this is your life, David Bannister. Uh, now you yes. started off, uh, very much as an editorial assistant of the journalistic group, but you've always been uh, fairly technically minded. How would you summarize your career? Um, yeah, mm, uh, as a welder, really, as I think I said the other day, I, I, I grew up in, in um, Clyde, as you can tell from my, my, my rich Glaswegian accent, I, I grew up in a town called Greenock on the Clyde, um, where there was a, at the time, I'm, I actually left the Clyde the same year as the QE2, um, it was some of my family had worked on the building, so I came from a, a fairly engineering-y type mental, but I was also uh, born in Greenock in, in the same year that IBM opened its factory there, where they later made the PC, and moved to Putney, where my mother got a job at ICL. So there was always that kind of theme going through through my life. So ending up, and actually rather than, you know, people used to say that you, those who can do teach, in, in, the, in the modern media world, those who can't do write. Um, so I, I happened to be at the right place at the right time and knew it knew enough about soldering hi-fi amplifiers and burglar alarms from personal uh, for practical electronics and things like that. So, so when personal computers came along, or microcomputers as we called them back in the late 70s, I, I was you know, the instant expert at the age of 20. Uh, so I used to be a sort of young whiz kid and now I'm sort of ancient old grizzly doing. Um, so, and, it, and it kind of moved on then. And it, it, what we were talking about the other day, and thanks, thanks to all, all of you who helped us workshop some of this material last week, um, and thanks for coming back as well. The um, just um, obviously you know, car crash attack attracts rubber neckers, but there we go. The um, it, it was a, it's kind of a, a journey as we say nowadays uh, through from the hardware through into the data processing information technology world, uh, and very much now. The, the data and the data sharing and, and, and open computing and, and, and all the things that, that, that go with that. So it, it, it sort of moved along following, you know, it, I was never ambitious enough to be a proper journalist and follow the money like Woodward and Bernstein, but I was always following the technology. And it was what was the next most interesting thing. Um, and that's, that's, that's why it's, you know, it, now in my 60s, it continues to be an interesting um, progression. Now this for me, next and, not for any of my readers, obviously, but that's a different thing. The, um, uh, this next slide looks at, uh, at that merry-go-round of decades of technology um, and, uh, you know, Ian Hillier Brook, uh, you know, is, is terrifying here. Um, I should probably be doing this in some sort of uh, accent. I remember all of your history. Um, yeah. Is, yeah. Uh, and Ian Harris would on. like to, Ian Harris would like to uh, trade trivia questions with you using uh, uh, Zien's information technology trivia 
list of 3,000 questions and all. Uh, but I think there was a really interesting question here from John Falk. Uh, John says, having had a similar computer history to David, punch cards, paper tape, Marconi, IBM, Hummers, Apple II purchase in 1980, Swift. What does David think has had the most uh, development in computing? Uh, to him, it's memory, tiny thumb drives with gigabytes of storage. But, you know, what's impressive to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think memory is is uh, is a key one. I, I think I said last week that I've actually just built my, what I think, having started off, you know, with building microcomputers and, and buying an Apple II, I mean, that was just a consumer purchase, basically, isn't it? You know, you should have been soldering together your NASCOM II and things like that. The, um, just a, a friend of mine still got one in the wrapper. I think he's, he's uh, Martin Banks is hoping that's his pension. He sells that to the Museum of Computing in Boston. The, um, but uh, yeah, it's a memory thing. I just I built the PC last year, and it's, it's got a terabyte uh, solid state disk drive that plugs straight into the video bus of the PC. It runs like proverbial off a shovel, and uh, and I, I was I was just gobsmacked to see it. And it, it, it's, you can almost not see the chip on on the tiny strip of board. It's a, it. So yeah, memory store. I, I think it's a coming to get, the thing about technologies I think, over the years, and look at all that list of things there, is it's the coming together of technologies. All of those concepts are around, but you know, I mean, when I worked on electronics weekly, the idea of sub nanoscale semiconductor manufacturing was, was, was theoretical physics. You know, people were talking, you know, Schrodinger tunneling effects and things like that, which we seem to just, you know, kind of just abandoned the laws of physics. And now we've got quantum computing. Which is you know yeah. reality, and there's a, there's a bizarre story in one of the, the feeds yesterday about quantum entanglement and tardigrades. So someone's managed to quantumly entangle a tardigrade, whatever that means. I have no idea what that actually means. It's like the quantum entanglement bit is fine, and the tardigrade, I have a vague idea, there's some little buggy type things that, that survive the nuclear holocaust. But to put the two together, and we're we're way out there now. <laughs> and you know. My, my daughter did a course in New York two years ago, and one of the first photographs she sent me from a science fair she went to was of a, a, an IBM quantum computer, and it looked like a chandelier as far as I could tell. It, it's, it's just a glass rods, <laughs> but it was it was actually cubiting away to itself. So yeah, yeah well, so all of those, all of those things. So I think moving beyond, you know, from the the, the memory, it's all of the things coming together. Yeah, it's a, you can't resist. Yeah, you can't resist a William Gibson quote. You know, the future's already here; it's just unevenly distributed. But you, you came up with a few rules of thumb, didn't you? That uh, we, we've got here on this uh, on this next slide. Um, and uh, you were also quite a big fan of uh, Sinclair. Julia George is, you know, what's today's technology that's the equivalent to the C5? And Trevor Hilder mm -hmm. says his Sinclair radio. Uh, micro radio worked uh, after he sent it back to be fixed. You know, technology was slightly different in those days, wasn't it? Yeah, technology was. I mean, I, 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 I can remember living in Putney. If anybody's ever been there, the, the corner of Putney High Street, there used to be a valve shop next to the next to the coffee grinding shop, and uh, I, I used to go down there and, and you know, like the Tony Hancock thing, buy my my beautiful valves. I know, I, I, I kind of wish I, I did actually spend um, built quite a few hi-fi amps for people. And some of them were valve based because transistors hadn't been invented. No, they had Jack Kirby, 1956. We all know that, but they weren't commonly available. But I, equally, I could go up the Edgware Road, which was the electronics uh, centre of the world, and buy IC chips, which is why I actually ended up going to Bangor to do electronics because it was the only uh, university in, in England and Wales at that time that was doing digital electronics in 1978. And then I didn't really see the point of going to one of the others, um, in Bristol. Um, to do uh, analog electronics. Um, I, I still got thrown out, it doesn't matter, but that's, <laughs> the technology ran so fast. The, um, I, I, yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was really bizarre. Some of those amps were, were built using op amps, which were really logic circuits in some ways. Uh, you could buy, you know, quad NAND gates for a, a penny, but you bought them by the kilo, like copper nails. Um, and, that, and, and now I, I, I wouldn't even know where to buy a transistor. I mean, there's billions of them on the ship. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, so yeah, so certainly transistors have become invisible. Um, but loads of the other enabling technologies, you know, the standards that go in there, like you know, the uh, I think we've, we've talked about um, 
modem and sort of something for you. Was it Z23 bits or whatever it was called? I can't remember anymore. X25 networks, all of those things have just disappeared into the web. Um, so the invisible or, or absorbed, whatever you know, it's, it's the board collective in a way of technology. Yeah, well, you, it's kind of your second uh, rule of thumb there about the technology being absorbed. You know, thermionic va valves are, are transistors. <laughs> Now we're bringing back LPs, but that's the visible bit, and uh, the real stuff is all absorbed. I've, I've got a little poll question for everybody here about your rules of thumb, and while I launch that, do you want to just say a couple of words about each uh, each of your rules? Yeah, I think when it becomes invisible is is, is one of the the I mean, or adopted, or um, I, I think I think someone last week, John Schlesinger from Ten last week said that you know we only call it technology when it doesn't work. The um and, and, and I, that, that's a that's is it the corollary or just the opposite? The um you know things things like the you know internet protocols that we used to argue in committees about for for years and years and years, and we're still doing that with in other areas in, in finance. You know, obviously, ISO twenty o two two is still sort of I've, I've been writing about that for twenty twenty five years, and and that probably means someone else has been working on it for the previous twenty five years. The um, so yeah, it, it's, it's, it just becomes part of the fabric. Car, cars have gone the same way. I mean, these cars have gone. Yeah, I I every time I I, I belong to a car club in London where you just hire it by the hour, and I can never actually get the car started because I'm looking for the key. And apparently, you have to sort of there's a whole startup sequence, so you, something like that that's out of Star Trek. Um, yeah. and, and, it, and and one time I had to phone them up, and it turned out the key was in my pocket, and that was okay because the, the car knew. But so that, even the car key was invisible. Um, so the, the, there's those kind of things, and I I, I think yeah, the, the, the two things absorbed elsewhere um, is there's probably you know, this is what people are doing with APIs. I mean, you, Starling are just you know, Starling as a service in, in banking. Um, here, here we go. This is where folks uh, agree with you. Fifty percent <laughs> of the audience believes technology is only truly adopted when it becomes invisible. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask this poll at the end as well, uh, but it's a, it's a good indicator of where it is because I personally, in a conversation with you, changed my mind about which was my favorite. But we'll come back to that in a minute. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. Also, I might point out that uh, Trevor Hilder has kicked in that a lot of what we're talking about is infrastructure. Infrastructure is all the stuff we depend on, but don't know is there until it goes wrong. Uh, yeah, which, yeah, which is certainly the case. Um, but let's let, let's let's proceed a little bit, and let's let's have a look at some of the uh, the, the bigger issues out there. Now, mm -hmm. David, you know you've covered things for ages, and uh, we have an interesting thing. We have a privacy question question here. Herbie Skeet, mm -hmm. an old friend of yours, says David was right. one of the legendary early journalists covering the market data space from the late 70s onwards. Uh, now, this question is covered by the 30-year rule. David, can you now answer the question we all wanted answered over the years? Who was your Reuters mole? <laughs> well, it wasn't Herbie. That's, I, I can categorically say it wasn't Herbie, although lots of, it was very useful that lots of people at Reuters thought it was Herbie. And I, in fact, they were telling me that before I'd even met Herbie. So, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna say because this guy protect my sources and i think herbie knows <laughs> and, no. Uh, no no but, they, but, but we, we used to have a convention i was working at waters at the time and it was an american company so every time i sent in a uh, a story that said uh, a senior reuters source they would say a, a source how many sources name your sources because they're very american sort of new york um and, and quite rightly um, and the Brit journalists were operators to shoot from the hip a bit more. So we came up with this, the, the idea that if, if I said a senior Reuters source, they knew who it was. And it was a senior Reuters source, four table and stuff. But yeah, I mean, there was a time when, when one of the other market data companies, um, I was at, it was a sacking offence to talk to me at that time. Um, that was Telly Rates. They've got the, the senior. And I, the, the fax came, the fax, there's a technology. We, the fax machine sprang into life for the offices of dealing with technology. And it was a, uh, a memo that had gone around in Telluride House, in, in the original house, and uh, in New Fetter Lane, saying it is a sacking offence to talk to David Bannister in de dealing with te technology. And uh, I, I was quite hurt, well, kind of pleased as well. 
um, because we must plug these leaks. So it's similar to the Reuters, but it was a, you know, a rival and, and big spirit company. And uh, three more factories came through, all, all with a copy of this internal memo. So I phoned up the PR woman and, and said, uh, what's this? And she said, uh, oh, she swore um, in, in, in a properly Anglo-Saxon <laughs> manner. And she said, there were only five people in that bloody meeting. So I had four copies of the memo. She was the fifth. She was the only one that didn't send me a copy of the memo. But, yeah, oh. the leaks were the leaks were good in those days. Um, and I, and yeah, and, and well, it was different because, and this is a, this is the thing about you know privacy and media, uh, which is why I mean I take an interest in it, uh, both as a citizen and uh, as someone who sort of tries to find out other people's secrets, I guess, and you know, the, the hidden. Um, you know, it was, one of the famous newspaper proprietors, Robert Muir or something in the 20s, Beaverbrook maybe, said, you know, news is what someone somewhere wants to suppress. Everything else is advertising. And mm. there's, a lot of, there's a lot of truth in that. So there's a, there's a balance between the privacy of the individuals that you've got on, on the left hand of that and the privacy of governments, which, and, and the, you know, the, the concealing of the, the, the decision-making process, I suppose. And, and so corporate company secrets are, 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 are a different thing. And somewhere around there is trying to get that balance. I, I don't think, and I, I, I really hope, I was never underhand in, in trying to find out what people didn't want their customers to know. Um, and, but it, <laughs> the Reuters one was interesting because, you know, it used it used to be a it's an information company. It was at that time it was largely run by journalists. Now it's largely run by lawyers because it's about compliance data. So it's a very very different world. Now another another thing that people constantly ask about is this next slide. You know, is this the end of laws about Moore's laws? So uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. you know we had, uh, we had a, a lot of comments. Hugh Purser was kind of curious about your thoughts. You know, is Moore's law dead? And if so, has it been replaced by something new? Yeah, I, I, I kind of feel sorry for Mr. Moore um, because he, he, it, was a, it was a good statement. I don't, did he mean it to be a law, really? And it, 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 we, we, it's, it's proven remarkably robust. But I think and that slide that you, you've created there, I, I think changed it because it was originally about the number of transistors on a chip, which we've already covered vaguely, the, the trillions of the damn thing. And that will, of course, run into the, the laws of physics. The, uh, although it seems to be remarkably robust. But once you take it into the IoT space, and you look at edge computing and things like that, then the the connectivity of it's not just about the transistors on a chip; it's the transistors on all chips, and and how you connect those together, and then and how you wire them into you know, the, the neurons of the population of the world. So yeah, I, I can't see the end of interconnectivity except in a rather horrible sort of way. Um, you know, there's plenty of films where, where things stop being interconnected, usually involving sort of on sad loners with one one last shot in their pistol, wandering through the you know, blitz landscapes in North America. So hmm. yeah, we, we don't, let's not go there. <laughs> uh, I know, we, we, we could go there, and you know, you know, some some of the people are looking at nanotechnology. Charles, Prince Charles, of course, is famous for about the grey goo of nanotechnology that will engulf us. So it could it could happen accidentally. But you know, I I think it the continued interconnectedness of things machines, people, and machine-to-machine -machine communication is, is particularly going to fuel. It's probably going to get even more um, asymptotic up there. Yeah, so almost more Metcalfe's law than Moore's law going forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, just adjust your little, um, your speaker phone just a bit. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah sorry, it slipped down there. Um, so when when we're looking at uh, the concept of Moore's Law, which you might see it as being uh, replaced to some degree, uh, I guess, by uh, by connectivity, nevertheless, this next slide uh, was really looking at kind of the economic issues. In mm. the, they're really kind of two worlds uh, emerging, one might argue, of kind of East and West, in particular China. Um, uh, and uh, Dan Fianney is here, you know, is this fourth industrial revolution increasing global inequality? You know, what are some of the big economic issues out, out there that you, you're seeing, which I don't think would have featured as strongly in the early days of coverage of various newspapers and uh, PC worlds and things like that? 
Um, well, yes and no. Um, I mean, I, one of the things that first struck me when I looked at that map is it's very similar to you know, the, the conversations that were going around. It was really Brandt that coined the phrase north and south rather than east and west. So, you know, you look at Africa on that map and, and South America. Um, I mean, you could kind of ignore Australasia, but it's and that and that's that continues to be the case. So that's that's not just the case in terms of technologies and in, in, in our sense of IT technology. Um, you know, the, the the immunologists are very concerned about Africa in terms of immunization in, in the current situation. So and and without going too far down that particular road, you know the 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 China and um, and Russia situation. That's that's the east-west sort of geopolitics side of life, and that's becoming frustrating. But I I I, uh, I kind of worry a bit more directly. Sort of, it's a bit closer to home. I, I live in Westminster. I, I actually um, within the Division Bell area of, of, of the House of Commons. So you know, 15 minutes walk. If I if I was allowed to vote there, I'd be able to do that. I um, must, must get that bell fixed. The, um, and yet there are, we've probably got the highest concentration of rough sleepers in, in almost the whole country. And you know, uh, the, the, the school across the road, Greycoat Hospital School, where my daughter went, to a standard UK school. David Cameron's children went there, Michael Gove's children went there. There are rough sleepers and junkies sleeping outside that. And in, they were being delivered in ministerial cars. So that division in society, between the haves and have nots, and I don't know. I mean, you can you could argue that it's, it's, it's not. I don't think it, these days it's particularly a money issue as it was in my childhood. Uh, you know, uh, but I, I th there is a, an information gap. Maybe there's a educational gap. There's all sorts of things that aren't to do. I mean, if you look at you know, we're all sitting around. We we, we know about technology. We we're, we're kind of a sort of elite. Um, I mean, but it's different from the political elite, and it's different. So there are th those divisions, I think, are, are probably. M and d does information technology change that, or does information itself just change that? You know, the political guys are in the know; they're in that Westminster loop. Um, I just, I, I, I don't live in the Westminster bubble. I just happen to be a neighbour. The, um, I mean, it's, it's. I, I think that's as worrying, and it's. it's it's probably more polarized in some of the, you know, the other regions around the world where they've still got the economic issues as well as the you know, the educational and whatever else societal rifts. Mm -hmm. um, so, that's, that, by the way, that's my red side side background sort of just resurfacing there a bit. Well, John, uh, uh, John Falk is curious, you know, is technology becoming too complex and costly such that take up is hampered in developing countries? Um, but I would point out that uh, there's a really good question here from Michael Dury. In, in your opinion, why is the situation between the West and the East frustrating? Oh, blimey, where'd you start with that one? <laughs> um, I, 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 I certainly wouldn't start by asking me. The, um, that's, uh, that's an interesting well, let's, let's deal with the first one. Um, because that goes back to you know technology be, becoming invisible, um, and the, the, the classic line is uh, Chris Skinner was always using it about the number of um, phones in you know the, the smartphones in in Africa. So you had M you know, Pesa and things like that were enabled by the fact that smartphones were so easy to use because there's such smart technology in them, or even just standard Motorola handsets. Because uh, and, and and look at the way India has gone uh, in terms of the, the the again we're talking about infrastructures, but it's enabled by the possession of you know 86 billion whatever it is I don't know what the numbers are, they're just very large numbers with you know 10 to the nines behind them. The uh, you couldn't do that unless all of those mobile phones existed. So I, I don't know how how simple a technology you think an iPhone is. Um, but to me, it's a form of magic. It's a slab of. I know there's transistors in there. We used to make transistors. They were about this big. You know, the um, it, it could be valve driven, but they might just be very small valves in there. Apple haven't told me. It's it's a form of magic it has disappeared into that and it, i don't think the technology being complex is is, is the issue in fact it may be the, the opposite the fact that technology is so accessible and so available nobody quite knows what it's doing they trust it too much 
you know, there's a, there's a cartoon I think from New Yorker of people you know, consigning their souls into the, uh, the, 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 the in future archaeologists will think we worship these little slabs of silicon because mm. they won't be able to start them up. Um, so yeah, I don't think it's that. The <laughs> you have to go kind of right back to human nature. This it's a it's a big ugly world. Our, our grandparents and, and uh, knew all of this because there was all these bloody wars going on in their lifetimes. We've we've had. I mean, I, I'm 64 years old next year. Uh, well, hopefully, and um, if we get to April, the um, and the only wars have been fought on television far far away. Whereas you know, my my father was miss d day but you know what's that the liberation of belson so you know he had a they they lived through that they got bombed they got you know it was real and in the rest of the world it's still real so mm. it's nothing to do with technology in fact i've been well, it used to do with technology for into weapons grade stuff but you know let's not go there so it's, it's tuesday morning near christmas michael don't take us down those roads no no well actually at least at least you got your name check on your birthday so april april <laughs> next year april. Everybody. Send, you, thank you. Please, uh, please send whiskey. Yeah. And you also, you also allow me to kind of uh, drop in the Arthur C. Clarke. Any sufficiently yeah. advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Uh, but returning yeah. to magic, um, Sue Milton has two concerns. Uh, you know, with the internet, if we put all our eggs in one basket, and how disruptive uh, does David think quantum computing will be? <laughs> um. Oh well, uh, that's two questions, isn't it? The um, yeah, I worry about the internet in, in one basket. Yeah, in, in fact, we've already seen that in the last couple of years. There've been some serious internet outages um, because someone thought it was a really good idea to put it all through one node. We all know that single points of failure. You, you think you could just Google that, really? Um, the second question, much harder, much harder. Um, I don't know. Ask me again. Go on, ask me again. Yeah, to, really, to really, I've got to think about that one. My first reaction was, oh, God, why are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're moving on to the next slide where we're, we're kind of looking at the political aspects. Now, um, uh, PJ PJ Marino says that uh, you and he were supposedly responsible for coining the term reg tech. Um, you know, it, if so, has it been successful? Uh, you know, where's reg tech headed? Well, yeah, um, but just to be clear on why PJ thinks that, um, the actual thing is it was it was, it was coined by uh, Koshek Naran, who was the uh, uh, designer and layout guy on Banking Technology magazine, which I was working on at the time. PJ and I had the idea to do a, a sort of supplement about uh, regulatory technology. And because we had the website bankingtech.com, it made sense to call it RegTech. So we just used the same logo back to front. And we'd run it for two years. And for, this is well, seven or eight years ago now. Um, we ran it for two years and nobody bought a single bloody advert. It just it didn't click with anybody at the time. I mean, that's, that goes back to my nobody knows anything <laughs> stuff. And we thought, we thought we'd be really smart. Has it done anything? Yes and no. Um, some regulations have um unfortunately pj tends to work in the uh, uh the, the investment banking space where a lot of the regulation is really designed to stop banks doing things um you know so it's, it's all sort of post crisis and you know stop spending clients money don't take so many risks i mean have you really worked out the mass of derivatives that sort of thing um whereas in other areas um and I think one of the other questions we had in, during the last session was um, about the role of governments. So obviously that's regulatory in, in, in largely um, in, in the payment space and again back to infrastructure. But uh, the open banking regulations in Europe and the um, payment services directive, which kind of was the legal framework for that, uh, more or less, the um, created this very very fertile uh, field for development in, into what we we now see in, in, in terms of data sharing between financial institutions and, and a democratization of um, uh, of the, the uh, ability to handle your own data so it was kind of you know I, 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 I've got an HSBC account and a Starling account but they, they can share each other and I can use a third-party aggregator and I can hand over to various people that I might or might not trust. Um, 
and, and that that's been very 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 innovative and, and has changed and it's been it's been interesting the way that institutions have reacted to that it's um uh, when I was with Oven, we did a couple of papers looking around faster payments in the UK and where we might go next. And it was very clear some banks just viewed it as a, a regulatory challenge. And I, 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 I think it's PJ, I'll have the numbers. We, one of the first stats was that the, the pile of regulations is something at 14 times the height of the Eiffel Tower. But, and, and it is a regulatory challenge for lots of people, just proving that they're not being criminals. The, um, but other banks saw it as a, as a, a everybody's talking about the challenger banks coming and taking away their lunch. So they said, well, actually, no, it's, it's, a, it's a competitive landscape. We can be competitors as well. And then one or two banks that we're calling out, Danske Bank and did, did a fantastic job of creating an environment where they attracted developers. Um, they almost made their developer portal a, 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 a customer interface because that brought them more customers and they, they paid attention to that. It was a competitive play. HSBC in the UK has done really well, Barclays. Others have been a bit more, oh, oh God, we've got to do this and fill in these forms and just and, and not treated it as the opportunity they might have seen it as. So yes, uh, it, it, in some ways it's been a success. I think it's how people react to the regulations. I mean, there was a famous case, and actually, we, I can, it was a, uh, the general counsel of one of the large American banks, <laughs> begins with a C, the, um, said that his job as compliance officer was to tell people what was still legal. Yeah. And, well, and that was a kind of gloaty boast from an investment bank you, you know, that you don't really like to hear. Well, turning, up, turning back up to you, uh, Donald McRae is curious. David, what has been your most spectacular forecasting error? Oh, well, that's easy. That's an easy one. I am the man who turned down the Beatles. Uh, the 1981 uh, inv Invitational Computing Conference held near Heathrow Airport. Uh, I was still working for Electronics Weekly and I'd gone, I'd rushed out there on Wednesday um, <laughs> to, to try and get some news stories because I, so I was a news reporter, a, a trainee, trainee technical reporter grade seven on the NUJ scale. Um, and I had a, the time to do two interviews and, and I, a, a lovely PR company called Text 100 just started and, uh, and they had two clients there. Uh, I knew the guys. So they said, oh, come meet our clients. And one of them was a, a company called Rodime. It's, it made disk drives and they'd taken over the old NCR factory in Dundee, I think. And that's clearly a hardware story for Electronics Weekly. And, um, and the other was a guy called Bill Gates. Um, who had a, a, a basic, QBasic, I think he was trying to push that year. It was before the, you know, the proper MS-DOS versus CPM wars. And um, I shook his hand and said, I hope to catch up with you next time you're in the country. He's never phoned back. Uh, so well, Bill, if you're out there, you know, <laughs> there's still time. He's on the line here. Now, yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> just moving on a little bit, if we could to, um, believe it or not, there's a lot of interest here in the uh, geopolitics. <laughs> Um, and I got two questions that I, I think we can string together. One is from Carolyn Roberts. You know, what do you see as the role for governments in stimulating tech development? But equally, uh, a question from Daniel Broby: Do you think the UK has become a peripheral player in global technology? You know, and what do you think about the rise of China in a technological context? So, role of governments, and uh, where is the UK? Ah. Yeah, well, you, you go back. Um, uh, some some of the people in the social, I'm, I'm, I'm getting I'm sort of gauging the, the age of the, the, this audience. So Inmos, let's let's go with Inmos and the transducer. Um, back in the early eighties, um, Ian Barron's little little toy. Um, so that was a, that was a clear case of government investment, you know, direct investment in in uh, and, uh, into a, a new technology. Um, it was a very, very superior thing. The, the, the launch of uh, the Inmos transputer, I can't remember what year it was now, but, but very early 80s, um, was at the, at the Institute of Temporary Arts in, in, um, in the Mall. And it's the only press conference I've ever been to in the UK where people stood up and it, got, it actually got a standing ovation when, when they, they showed what they were doing with it. It was a butterfly flying across four screens, which in that time was just, mind bending um so that, so things like yeah the, yes there is a role to stimulate uh, where there is massive investments there was this there's, there's a i was listening to this on the radio there was a, a guy an astronaut an actual astronaut the apollo astronaut who's written a thriller 
and it's set on the dark side of the moon and involves blowing up Russians, so it's that kind of thriller. But he was talking about, uh, he, he was asked um, by, by the interview on the radio um, whether he, what he thought about all these billionaires going into space. And he said, well, I think it's great because in my days it was only trillionaires that could go into space, so only governments could do it. Yeah. And, and you know, now it's been, so that is that is a kind of progress of technology, it's the affordability. That's one of the things we're talking about here, actually, is you know, the, the ubiquity. Yeah, you know, I don't have to traipse up to the Edgware Road to buy a million transistors. I can just go to the O2 shop and buy them in a, in a slab of silicon. The uh, and, I, and that really struck me uh, about the you know the affordability, the accessibility of technology. So you know, yeah, I, I think, <laughs> I think you're right. The, the, the economics is frequently not talked. I mean, Trevor Hilder made yeah. a point here. You know, technology is constantly getting cheaper, not more expensive. Mm. And you know, I was chatting to you know kids, if I can call it, about you know for example, blockchain. And I said, no, all the components were there. There was a 1976 patent for blockchain, but economically mm. it was insane to be recording yeah. constantly. Uh, you know, you, you know, I was trying to stick, stick basically parabolic uh, trajectories into 4K of code and 16 hashes would have used up all of my memory. So there was no way I was going to do that economically. Now, um, yeah. David, we're coming close to time, but you, you had an ask for the audience, and I, I just wanted to make sure you had an uh, ask. Yeah, I do, yeah. Well, there's <laughs> loads, really. The um, um, it's my revenge. The I, I, well, you you put these slides up, so I, I when I when I say the go to jail, I think I think I mean, clearly um, it goes back to the, the the rules stuff about you know regulations and things you know don't be a criminal if you, if you if, especially if we're talking about financial technology that's that's an obvious one but i think in the wider technology thing uh, it probably plays into the um social equality area so please pay some tax that would be that would be quite useful and, and that that probably also and the difficulty of doing that of course is the the global um, situation because technology and we didn't go we didn't really answer the, the role of China by the way um, in, in the technology development thing but that and I think that comes down to your what you just said about the, the costs uh, I mean China is, is doing uh, at both ends of the scales but it's making things ridiculously cheap and not always well um, so there's a there's a quality issue at the bottom end but the stuff that they're doing at the large and the huge large infrastructure scale is I, I, it, unprecedented, I think, really, uh, outside the you know, post-war, uh, um, and, and slightly worrying, but that's a geopolitical thing as well. Um, I, I, I don't know. If, if 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 America was doing it, well, you know, like Biden's initiatives, I would probably welcome it. But that's because you know, knee-jerk, because it's our, our side. You know, it must be right. The so it's difficult to separate it from taking sides on that one. So, but in, in making you know the, the the tech companies pay the, the appropriate taxes, and again we have an initiative through United Nations and Biden and, and Gordon Brown. Let's give him some credit. Um, for for how are we going to do it? I, it's, I'm not so sure. You know, I, I still go back to what I said last week about you know shoot people that ride cycles on pavements or electric scooters yeah, yeah get 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 them off the bloody pavements put them under the trucks where they should live they um i live in central london it's a, it is a massive problem I, I nearly got run down by a guy on a motorcycle the other day on the pavement it's probably uh, partly because they're digging up the roads all the time but they, smaller anyway. cheap and much faster yes <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah exactly yeah um it, well in fact it, that's a that's a little reminder to me um could you encapsulate that little nugget about Nick Storff you shared with me. Oh well, yeah, uh, it, it's, yeah, it's an old, it's an old, old story. Um, I, just one of over the years, some quotes stick in your mind when you're scribbling them in your notebook. Uh, and this was back in oh, 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 early eighties. Everything's in the early eighties, as far as I can see. It must be getting very soon. Now. The um, it was when we'd moved from being microcomputers into PCs and there was on the horizon what the big computer manufacturers, which are a lot of the, that, the, in those days, of course, was the mini computer manufacturers, so digital equipment and people um, were, were, were going to do in, in the, what became known as the PC world. So you know, IBM hadn't launched the, 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 the PC and, and used that term. Um, it was a press conference in Hanover, during the Hanover Fair, um, 
with uh, Heinz Nixdorf, the actual you know the named named owner of Nixdorf Computing, which was a big mini computer manufacturer, um, and, and still embedded computing into various self-service things, most of the ticket machines at airports and stuff. Um, and Heinz Nixdorf was asked, you know, when it, when is Nixdorf going to launch a, a microcomputer? And he just sneered and said, "You wouldn't ask BMW to make a moped, would you?" And three three weeks later, Nixdorf launched their mini computer, their microcomputer. He, nobody had told him; they, they, it was already on the manufacturing stocks, but nobody bothered to tell the boss. And uh, and digital digital equipment launched one, ICL launched one, IBM famously launched one, and, and, and Alan Sugar had a bit of a go as well. Well, I'm going to um, move along just a little bit. We've got a couple more things to cover. Probably the biggest thing, though, is I'd like having listened to some of this stuff. I'm going to pop up here for the audience to answer a poll again. You know, having listened to today's webinar, which of Bannister's rules of thumb is your favorite? Um, we did in fact have a couple of comments. As well. Yeah, well, <laughs> rules of thumb. And uh, Nick Bush uh, and uh, John Schlesinger both have things very similar about the first law of technology being, you know, if it doesn't work or nobody cares about what you do till it goes wrong, all of which is fairly reminiscent, in my opinion, of uh, that, that famous quote from Douglas Adams, you know, technology is stuff that doesn't work yet. Well, the audience is just answering that, and I'll leave it up over half the audience have voted, but just quickly, David, uh, John Falk would like to know what very highly priced piece of technology, outrageously priced, would David like for Christmas? Um. Oh, e. Well, that's a, uh, I, I'll, well, this is one for the hi-fi addicts, really. I'd like a, an SME3 uh, tone arm with a, a, a Shure M25 ED2 cartridge on it, please. <laughs> and why? <laughs> because it was just the single best um, tone arm ever made for it. Oh, you, you probably want to know what turntable I'd be running that on. That's a Lin yeah. Sunday. The, um, <laughs> So, yeah, hi-fi answer there, because that was when hi-fi was high, as opposed to this overly processed things that goes through lots and lots of transistors on the way out. Well, I and I've, obviously, I, obviously, that would be able to drive my m mission uh, speakers really properly. So, yeah, hi-fi. As you can see, the audience hasn't changed their mind uh, very much. Technology is only truly oh. adopted when it becomes uh, invisible, still favoured by... Uh, half the audience in fact gone up slightly i think from memory it's gone, uh, gone up slightly yeah but it's interesting that people are still trying to pan for unicorns <laughs> yeah the unicorn well, just, panels are, 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 we've alienated them well just this next slide i mean one of the things i would point out folks a little bit of an advertisement that the british computer society has an area called archives of it believe it or not uh, and I was trawling it uh, over the weekend to do a small blog post about it. For example, David, they put up uh, Butler Cox Foundations. All of the Butler oh. Cox reports are up there. And it's okay. really oh. interesting. For example, there's a 1984 report from Butler Cox, uh, which talks about how video text is going to take over the world and doesn't mention the Internet anywhere. <laughs> so <laughs> it was kind of, it was kind of assumed, I imagine. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell Robin. Exactly. <laughs> this, yes. Uh, but anyway, just to, just uh, finally here, we, we kind of come to theological bargains from David Bannister. Uh, all the things you're trying to sell us. Are you an optimist or a pessimist, David? And if so, why? I, I, yeah, classic cockeyed optimist, really. Um, but also a gloomy, uh, lapsed Calvinist pessimist. The, um, yeah, the, yeah, in the you know, Douglas Adams, long dark tea time of the soul. The um, quite gloomy about international prospects at the moment you know i worry like that's maybe just an age thing but but on the whole i i, I, I am ridiculously optimistic on those days against all the evidence um uh, then one of, one of my sort of work mantras is, is if, if it's not fun it's not worth doing so um yeah definitely optimistic really um but i but that said i can see that it might all go a bit and i, I think you know, covid has shown us that it's probably um sort of for for my generation or my daughter's generation um the nearest thing to you know the second world war they've ever dealt with without all the bombs and death well maybe some of the death actually the um so it's it, it, yeah it, it's, it's a funny time to be asking because of the, you know, the, the because we're, we're going to get locked down. 
Uh, put it this way, around here in Westminster, everybody's expecting it <laughs> any yeah. day now. Well, let's remain cockeyed optimists, but sadly, yeah, I've got to yeah. pull this a bit to a close. I don't think we've ever had uh, such interaction, over 50 questions, which is uh, most unusual. Um, but uh, if I can, to conclude our final webinar of the season, um, a very sincere thanks uh, for all of the sponsorship during 2021 as we've conducted uh, well over uh, 200 uh, webinars. So thank you very much for that. And a fun session to end on with thanks here from Trevor Hilder uh, and a number of others. Uh, I'd also like to uh, thank you, the audience, for uh, turning up on many, many days repeatedly uh, in some cases or casually, if not. Delighted to have you here, but uh, we do have a rich program next year. I think we've already got some 80 events scheduled and just a small taster that we'll be opening the year with a little bit of a warning about how insecure your websites. Uh, a fascinating session the week after on getting to grips with longevity, where Simon Colhane, uh, CEO of the Chartered Securities Investment, is going to share what is effectively kind of a private research project he's been running. So lots happening and lot, lots coming up in the new year. But our sincerest thanks of all, all, of course, must go to you, David. Uh, it's become a bit of a, an icon here that I have a piece of technology. It's a medieval uh, from, from, from Korea, and it's what I'm afraid I have to use for applause on these sessions because, as yet, uh, video conferencing has failed to come up with a suitable applause meter. So here is my <laughs> Korean karmic clapper thanking you uh, for closing the year out in such an upbeat tone. And we wish everybody is a cockeyed optimist and that their cockeyed optimism is, in fact, rewarded uh, over, over so. weeks. So thank you, David. Oh, thank you, Michael. Thank for thank me, having me back so soon as well. <laughs> and see you in the new year. All right. Have a great time, everybody.